Welcome, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, we're hoping that you are here for more than child's play, games for early learners. If not, someone can probably help you find another room, or you might be surprised and, and enjoy the session. Um, so we are excited that everyone is here, um, especially given the schedule's changes. Um, and I, we're actually just going to go ahead and get started. What we're going to have everyone do is just briefly give um, a brief um, who, who each of the panelists are. Um, their role, their organization, and um, something they think it's important to keep in mind for when you're designing for um, early learners. Go ahead and start with Ellen. Hello. Okay. I'm Ellen Doherty. I'm the executive in charge of production for the Fred Rogers Company. We produce um, Peg Plus Cat, Odd Squad, and Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood for PBS Kids. Um, and oh, the thing to keep in one thing to keep in mind when designing for kids is really to keep in mind who the kid is, how they, how old they are, where they are developmentally. A two-year-old is not a three-year-old, is not a four-year-old, is not a five-year-old, and is not a six-year-old, is not a seven-year-old. There's just such a span, and often people say, you know, this is a game for three to five-year-olds, and it's like it might be, but like, how are you making that happen? So that's my my uh, principle. Hi, I'm Ingrid Simone. I'm from Tokoboka. If you don't know Tokoboka, we are a leading mobile-first kids app developer. Uh, we have 34 apps in the App Store uh, and 140 million downloads. Uh, we are only five years old, so we're relatively new compared to some of the uh, panelists. Um, I work on content for parents primarily. Uh, my background is in uh, early childhood education and uh, journalism. Uh, prior to Tokoboka, I was at an organization called Common Sense Media. I was on the team that launched graphite.org. Check it out. It's, uh, it's a ratings and review site for educators using digital media in their classrooms. Um, I'm also parent to two kids, one of which is probably the first, part of the first generation of kids that has no recollection of life without an iPad. So I come from that perspective as well. I realized I didn't introduce myself. I'm Katrina Stevens, the deputy director for the um, department, or the um, Office of Education Technology. And one of the things that we're excited to be doing is that we are writing a brief right now that's on early learning in ed tech. Um, and we're partnering with the STEM office of the department and as well as HHS. I'm Joe France. I am the uh, game designer at a company called CodeSpark. We make a game that teaches how to uh, kindergartners how to program. Um, a game is called The Foos. I've been in educational and health games as a designer for the past five years. Um, and I'd say my one thing to keep in mind when designing games for kids, uh, particularly educational games for kids, um, while we have learning objectives that are really important, um, at such a young age, you're often going to be making the first impression that kids have with the subject material that you're teaching. And it's so important to instill in them um, a passion for it at this early age. You know, It's not really that important if a kid can solve major programming problems when they're five years old, but it is really important that they can see themselves as a programmer and can see themselves as a successful person in whatever you're trying to teach them. Hi everyone, I'm Sarah DeWitt. I'm from PBS Kids. I oversee digital development at PBS Kids and distribution of games from so many PBS Kids producers who actually all are in this room right now. There's so many of you here. Uh, and. Um, and many of our researchers are here as well. Uh, the principle that, that I think comes to mind is making sure that when we're designing experiences, particularly for very young children, that we're leaving enough space for imagination. Rather than dictating every move that they might make, recognizing that even the simplest interaction is a real point for the child to kind of take the game in their own direction. Uh, and they might just want to play with that interaction before even getting into your game, and that's great. And uh, hopefully we'll end up having more of a discussion or conversation. So I'm going to throw out some questions, but as, as um, and feel free to kind of respond to each other and react. And we're going to have some time actually at the end as well to um, to take some questions from from the audience. But if you if something is happening and you really want to kind of ask a question about a, a conversation that's happening, please also feel free to jump in. I'm going to kind of start with a kind of an easy question, which is really. Um, how is designing for early learners different than a kind of traditional commercial game design? Oh yeah, I'll start. Um, so for our game, one of the things we do for early learners is we use no words throughout the product. Um, and uh, in design circles, you kind of get this idea of, oh, if it's a label, if you have to put a label on it, there's a mistake. Um, but actually, labels can be really useful sometimes. And so when you 
give yourself that restriction where you're, you're doing something entirely without words, it really um, emphasizes other ways that you have to teach the early learners, right? Because something we try to do for coding is make sure the words don't get in the way, um, which can happen very easily. You know, if you show kids syntax, if you show kid language and they're struggling to pronounce something, they're not really going to have a, a fun programming experience. Um, so figuring out how to communicate without words, um, that's both, you know, um, monkey see, monkey do. So showing them the correct answer once or showing them pictures or showing them animations, videos. There's all sorts of other ways to communicate um, and it's very tricky to do that properly and it'll take more time than you think it will. <laughs> Anyone else? I think similarly, kind of jumping on that, um, the partic very young children just want to jump right into the experience and don't want to, uh, they don't need <laughs> instructions necessarily or they don't want them, I should say, uh, and want to jump right in. Uh, similarly, we feel, because we also distribute a lot of streaming video, um, kids are kind of in a different frame of mind whether they want to watch a show or play a game. So if you put a long video intro in a game, they're very likely to just skip right through. They kind of know what mode they're in. Um, I'll, add, I'll add that um, one of the things, at least at Tokoboka, that we focus on is keeping uh, the play experience really open-ended for young learners. Um, not every app lends itself, or not every topic lends itself to that, but for the kinds of apps that we make, um, having open-ended creative play experiences is super important for that age. Ditto. <laughs> <laughs> um, how is, or what is the responsibility of, of game designers to really make games for young children educational um, and developmentally appropriate? Uh, well, it's kind of a loaded question. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there <laughs> is a responsibility to do that. I mean, I guess I would say that it's, it's, there's a great opportunity for all kinds of games, games in which you're learning a lot, games in which you're not learning anything at all but having mm -hmm. a great time. That's all fair. But um, if you're making games for learning to make them be really thoughtful about how you're doing it and making things achievable and making things like they were talking somebody was talking about this morning that like it needs to be an ex you know you want that learning experience to your point a few minutes ago to be really rich and robust and good so that it's like there's something to achieve and you can get there but it's also it's a little challenging it's a little out of reach but you can you can get there but how to support them in that as well how to scaffold the games how to level the game so that the kid um, doesn't just check out because it's too hard and just boom, gone. So to give them that, that extra hand to be able to stick through and figure out that thing that's a little difficult maybe for them. And if the game can self-level and scaffold and do that so that it offers that extra hand, that's a great way to keep them engaged, I think. Um, I, I don't know why I don't like this microphone. Um, I would also add that um, you know, young learners, even if you're not setting out to be educational, most of the media that kids interact with, they're learning something from it. So even if you're not setting out to teach them the ABCs, you may be, um, you know, you've got these kids that haven't developed their worldview yet. And so you may be giving them messages about, you know, how women are treated in the world or how, you know, you know how friend groups work. Um, I think that just remembering that there's more to um, creating learning games than just probably like the traditional um, kind of subject you're thinking of. I think it's also important, sorry. <laughs> keep going in order, I'm gonna jump yeah. around. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think it's also just important to remember that for particularly young children, like we're, you know, we're talking about preschoolers, many of us, um, they aren't actually the ones who are making the decision about what game they play, and the parent is the one who um, is gonna walk into this experience looking for something educational for their child. And so that's kind of, that, that's, that's the first thing the parent is looking for almost always that we hear mm -hmm. for these preschoolers. And I think it's context dependent too. So uh, for coding, um, one of the big challenges coding has right now is there's not enough women and minorities in it. And so um, for our game, you know, the very first character that you play is like a female police officer. Um, and so we're, you know, depending on what your subject is, you want to be aware of what problems exist in the world and what things you can do to help those problems along. It's not just about getting a kid to have a, a mental model of programming, right? Um, you want to be able to project themselves into the game. So like f our characters are um, these goofy little characters. This guy's kind of androgynous, maybe boyish. Um, but most of our characters, um, most of our aspirational characters are actually female. So we have like a female astronaut, a female police officer. Um, and then most of our boy characters are kind of goofy. Um, and they're actually pink and purple too. So we have like a chef and a construction worker. 
Um, and so kind of um, putting that out there that, you know, it's not just about your gameplay. Your framing is very important for kids who are being, like I said, exposed to this frame for maybe the first time ever. And a couple of you raised the, the sort of idea of, of families. Um, how are you, uh, when you're designing games, how do you figure out how to get that interaction with an adult or, or with siblings when you're designing for a game? Um, well, for Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood, we recently did an app, mm -hmm. um, Barnyard Match, that really, that very subtly prompts the kid to choose um, at the beginning of the game if they're going to play alone or with someone else. And it kind of um, prompts, I think, a parent interaction. So and that's just a, like a concentration matching game. And just that, um, so that's one way to encourage co-play is to really just absolutely build it in and invite the parent, invite the child to invite somebody else to play, to invite the parent to play. Mm -hmm. I think we've talked too that there's, there's an opportunity here in that the, the device often belongs to the parent and they are handing it to the child. I mean, it, there's some exceptions to that, but often mm -hmm. it's the, the parent's device. And, um, and we often hear that as much as co-play would be amazing, most parents are, are handing it to their kid when they need to make dinner or, or take a shower. And so thinking about things that even could be breadcrumbs left on the device, um, you know, whether it's something that shows up in the photo gallery that's, that then sparks a conversation with the parent, or the questioning uh, that the character engages with with the child that might be a line that the child would then continue with their parent, really trying to also think about What's the moment later where the parent and child can interact that I think can be really exciting about this? Um, and I'd say parents and children look for such entirely different things in games that um, you have to think about how to present it differently to each. So we have a game creator in the Foos where the kids can reprogram all the elements in the game. And so the things that the kids really love to do um, is just to make things very wacky, right? Um, both boys and girls. Uh, they love everything to jump around and everything to explode. And you know, there's lots of cats on the screen. Um, and so the kid gets so excited about this and they show it to their parent and they're like, look what I made. And the parent's like, I, you know, I don't see any objectives being completed here. <laughs> and so um, figuring out how to look, um, you know, one of the things we're doing is looking at the metrics and figuring out how to take those metrics, turn that into a report that we can say, hey parent, when you see cats jumping around the screen, it means this thing. It means your kid's learning sequencing. It means your kid has, you know, showed evidence of loops, of events. like. This means something, so you can be excited about it too. I think a lot of cats on the screen is also just a good design principle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just uh, wanted to add to what Joe said, um, and pro w what a lot of people have uh, uh, reiterated. Um, I, uh, you know, we have a lot of choices and apps, and parents, you know, they're making all these decisions. I think communicating with them um, is a challenge. I think for a lot of developers, even you know, even though we communicate with parents. Um, it's sort of hard sometimes to convey, like like Joe said, like what your kid is doing. Um, I think giving, you know, a lot of parents maybe don't even have the interest of playing all the games with their kids. So just sort of giving them, um, whether it's prompts or just some kind of um, into the game where even if they're not actively playing with them, then they can um, still have a conversation and help them relate it to their real lives. Can you bring up real lives? <laughs> Um, what is the balance between uh, encouraging students or young young people, um, early learners, to be playing with games versus you know getting out and actually playing in the real world? And how do you kind of manage that? <laughs> I I think one of uh, you know PBS from very far back the mission was really to inspire kids to want to get excited about learning and then take that beyond the screen that they're interacting with. And I think one of the things that, um, well, uh, to answer your question first, I mean, I think there's, there's obviously a balance. You know, there needs to be, if kids are going to play with the screens, then we need to be thinking about what else might they be doing. But how can that screen then prompt that other interaction? One of the apps we just worked on um, was for the show Ready, Jet, Go, uh, which is um, focused on astronomy. And what we did then was use a star finder kind of activity. So the, the child is playing a game with this tool where they can look at the constellations, but then the idea is you get so excited about it that you then want to go look at the stars yourself. So how can you then get that excitement, that passion so great that the child then wants to put it away and go try something else? I think that's something we can all strive for. I, you know, I think this is a bit of the million dollar question that any new parent is struggling with right now just because we haven't had to, we've had TV, but we haven't had such media available um, 
for such young kids. And so, you know, I think there's a lot of, um, one of the things we can do is not get in the way of the parent, right? So I think parents are really um, responsible for having their kids, managing their kids' time on a screen. Um, and one of the things that we do for teachers um, for this very thing is that we allow them to turn off certain things in the game. So if you have, uh, we've got an incentive system in the game that you know the kids um, can get new blocks for their levels that they create, but if that's distracting in the classroom, then we allow them to turn it off. Um, and so it's looking at those same sort of things in the home environment, right? If there's something that um, is working for some kids and parents are really happy with, um, but other parents are saying, you know, they're just spending all their time in this mode, they're not actually learning anything anymore, figure out how to allow the parent to, to not get in the parent's way, right? And to support the parent for um, how they're going to use your game and their workflows of educating their kid. I, th I think maybe one other thing with preschoolers is to is that when you're making games that are highly relatable, then that will make it easier for kids to make those connections in their everyday lives. So for example, again with Daniel Tiger, um, there's an app that's about routines. And so that is you know totally a digital experience. It's not not something to incorporate in the moment in routines, but hopefully there are those learning moments in the game that a kid will be able to translate because it's very similar to what they experience throughout the day and help them think about and ha routines and help parents also think about what those routines might be. And I'm gonna push a little bit too, like how do we get, because parents are, are actually struggling to make some of these decisions. Um, <coughs> it used to be years ago when we, when we were just looking at screen time, you know, there were, I'm sorry, <coughs> there are recommendations that you know, student that children under two shouldn't see a screen at all. Um, and as that, that was really talking about you know, static or uh, watching a movie or a TV, um, often even adult TV. And as media has shifted and changes so much, you know, parents are like, well, you know, is it okay if my child is on FaceTime to talk to a relative who's at a distance? You know, and that wasn't part of those original conversations, so it's now starting to get more nuanced and, um, and parents, again, are, are struggling to make those decisions. And sometimes they make decisions like, I've got to take a shower, and I need to put my child <laughs> you know, here. And th those are just real life things, and we don't want parents to feel guilty about those. But how do we help them find that balance? How do we help them make good, rec good recommendations or decisions as, they're, you know, as they're, they're trying to have their kids go out and play, but also really uh, be using digital devices? That is the million dollar question. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, if you're lucky enough to get featured in the App Store, that certainly helps, and you try to get press. and social media promotion, but that is really, you know, Common Sense Media does a lot in terms mm -hmm. of if, if parents actively seek it out, that's a curator, but it's definitely something that everybody, that's the really is the million dollar question. We always recommend that parents start by thinking about their own kids' interests, mm -hmm. that, you know, if they're really, really, really into dinosaurs, let's start by looking for something that's about dinosaurs, because you know that's going to play into that passion they have, and then we also always suggest going to commonsensemedia.org. I mean, it's just a really great resource if you all haven't seen it. I mean, the, the, uh, there's a, a, a recent um, a book that came out that they're talking about some of this, like how do parents find it? And one of the, the key ways that most parents did was actually going to the App Store and looking to see what was most popular. Um, but how do we help parents make the distinction between what's most popular or most fun um, versus like what's really good for their kids? The App Store, um, I mean, they're definitely parents are trained to look for ABC. Oh, that's educational, <laughs> or one, two, three. But there's actually there there's nothing that specifically um, th there's no criteria exactly for what is educational or not. And so I think that's something that that um, many of us and many people in this room I know struggle with too. Is how do you communicate to a parent how educational this is? You may have done studies on it. You may have done all kinds of things, but sitting in the app store next to somebody that's got just ABC on it? Or how do you think even just beyond literacy and math? Mm -hmm. You know, it's a real, that's a real struggle, but you're absolutely right. I mean, the majority of parents are making their decisions based on the app store, mm -hmm. I think. Um, I will also uh, plug Common Sense Media. <laughs> um, they do, and not just because I used to work there, but they do lots of curated lists, um, and they have, they actually have a learning rating, um, um, especially if you look at the graphite.org feature site. Um, and, but I will say that um, there's still a limitation to that because a lot of it really is heavily focused on what teachers can teach and assess in the classroom. And it does get trickier when, you know, kids, you know, young kids especially are learning through play, and that could be a lot of different forms. 
and it could be um, social emotional learning, it could be creativity. Um, it's, you know, these are things that are harder, I think, for some parents to wrap their head around as a form of learning. So, um, yeah, communicating that, um, looking at common sense and similar resources. The other one is um, teachers, actually, because mm -hmm. teachers are a little bit easier to reach en masse because they're seeking things out maybe a little bit more and there are more tools for reaching those communities. Um, and so when a teacher says to the kid, play this at home or suggest it to the parents, that's gold. So maybe that is one way is to you know use teachers as ambassadors because they are. And a lot of times they do recommend games. You know, kids are playing them in school, even little ones. And you know, if they communicate to the parents about that, you know, in their virtual classroom or whatever, that's a really that's really wonderful. And the book that I was referencing before is Read, Write, Click. Um, if you haven't taken a look at it, there's some really good materials and resources, um, and kind of it walks through a lot of these these issues for I think it's zero to eight is really what it's really looking for. Um, I'm going to pick up on something that you had talked about, Ingrid, which is the um, the social and um, emotional learning. Um, and, and those other kinds of soft skills. So it's one thing, it kind of goes back to what you were saying earlier around parents look for A, B, C, and they look for, okay, I'm like, I'm not, yes, they're learning to read, or they're learning their math skills. Um, how, how can games um, teach some of these soft skills, and what's possible with, with games? I think part of it is that you have to kind of mix it in. Um, so as they talked about, um, uh, at Magic Leap this morning, right? Like just improving things, not always doing new things. I think it's much more palatable if you uh, introduce a new thing as you're marketing the thing that you've improved, right? So if you say, hey, we're teaching ABCs and we're doing it better than anybody else and um, we're, um, you know, your kid's going to learn so much faster. It's, it's easier to then also hook a new thing that the kid is learning on top of that, right? So. Um, for our game with the foos, we teach logic with the coding, but we also um, we looked at actually some of the art standards that have come out. And art teachers are really um, they're adopting art standards really quickly, right? They want to um, have some legitimacy for art, right? That gets cut, so they want to really give some structure around it, right? So it's not just um, something random; it's something that people understand. There are standards, and there are specific things you can learn. And so our game creator actually aligns really well with the art standards. And so by saying, hey, parents, like, look, your kid's getting critical thinking, they're getting problem solving, they're getting all this sort of stuff, the parent can feel good about that. And then you say, oh, and also, there's a lot of creativity we can teach in this game. You know, it's much harder to measure, but, I mean, look at what the kid's done. The parent is now, you know, kind of their, their prefrontal cortex, right? Their logical side's like, okay, yeah, we're meeting the objectives. Um, and then the other side's, oh, and look what my kid made. You know, they can kind of calm down a little bit. Um, if you present it as a, as a double package. I would say that good game design inherently is teaching those skills. I mean, if we really are doing a good job at keeping kids kind of at the edge of their ability, then we're working with, with persistence. Mm -hmm. If they have, you know, if, it, if it's a game where there are right and wrong answers, then we've got an opportunity to introduce like overcoming failure and moving through that. If you've got character interactions, are they modeling are they modeling appropriate interactions for a preschooler or are they modeling something that isn't what you want your kids to be mimicking? I mean, I think this, these are things that are actually inherent in gameplay and it's really about thinking about the best way to be presenting those uh, to young children within a really good game. And well, and, and also just like in terms of really young children and what they need to be learning, there are also some of the, the I don't know, human skills like using the potty and there is a Daniel Tiger app for that that <laughs> we made <laughs> with uh, Shell Games. And it's really, it was very successful and it's one of those things where it's like, again, probably not used at the same time, hopefully, but you know, you can take what you learn from the game and then apply it in life. But it's something, it's, I guess the, the thing about that is that it's, it's kind of social emotional learning and it's about being three years old or four years old, but three years old and really this is what you need to learn about. And a game can really help with that if it's you know done well. But even something like using the potty. And this came up a, a few times in some of the earlier comments. But as we're thinking about designing um, games for all children, um, you know, for diversity of learners um, uh, and student 
how do you make sure in Newberry's like making sure you, some of your characters are women, uh, that might be sort of non-traditional, um, and thinking about other kinds of representation. Uh, so one, like how is it they're really making sure that all we're reaching all learners, and uh, but then I would also add another piece of that in terms of students uh, or young people who. Um, uh, may have different learning differences. They might um, be visually impaired or have other kinds of, like how does that get, and when does that get kind of brought into the process of designing games? Hello? Oh my goodness. Uh, well, it should be brought into the process of the games from the very beginning. Um, I'm gonna, um, gonna mess with semantics a bit. Um, so I think games should definitely be inclusive and accessible, um, but as a designer, one of the things you should watch out for um, not your game shouldn't appeal to or it can't appeal to everybody absolutely everyone so you shouldn't exclude people right and you should make sure as many people can play your game as possible um, but one of the things for the foos right we want the kids to do coding and coding is about stopping and you know um, kind of predicting how a plan's going to play out in your head and then putting that plan in action and seeing where it messes up and then iterating when it does mess up um, and that's not going to appeal to every single kid. Now we can lower the bar as much as possible, right? We can say like, oh, you know, we'll give you help when you get stuck, we'll make it fun, we'll make it aspirational. But if a kid really doesn't like planning, if they, if they just get turned off by it, then um, you, know, you should reach out for the people who really are going to love the gameplay that you have. Um, so that's mm -hmm. a different take. Yeah. Others, Ellen? Well, I think back to just even the creating uh, creating characters um, of making sure that the child feels like they're being represented and that doesn't mean it has to be you know people um, you know it it can be animals it can be, but it needs to be representative of what looks like um, of a wide enough range that children can identify with something in this that is like them particularly for these younger kids that's really critical is being able to see themselves and to be able to recognize themselves mm -hmm. in that in experience um, I, uh, uh, Joe mentioned, like, it can't be everything to everybody, I think, and I, I would agree with that, but I also think that, um, you know, if you, at least a company like Tozboka, um, and I think everyone up here, like, you have a, a range, a suite of apps, basically, and so maybe every single app is not going to appeal to every single person, but you can, if you look at, you know, across your apps, are you hitting, um, are you excluding, you know, you have 10 apps, and then you've excluded still this whole group of children across them, so I think, um, you know, being really um, intentional about how you are inclusive is important, but just also remembering that you can't do everything in one app, but you can do a lot across several apps if you are in the position to make several apps. Uh, <laughs> in terms of, um, well, I have sort of an example of like a fail in this area, okay. in which I was um, at a conference at Gallaudet University, which is a university um, primarily for people who are hard of hearing and deaf, and I was talking about an app that two of the professors had seen at a <coughs> IDC conference and they really loved it. But what I realized when I was talking to everyone about it and it was like, oh, they really like this app. And then I realized, oh my gosh, so many of the instructions are verbal. The visual support is poor. I don't really know if deaf kids can actually play this app with great success and with as much you know, robust learning as we had designed with all the verbal prompts. And that kind of bummed me out. And it was really like in the middle of doing this exact kind of thing where I was talking to a bunch of people and I went, and I think we need more visual support in our <laughs> apps. <laughs> so I, I, you know, you can't design for everybody, but I do think that it's one of the things that comes up, I think a lot in games for learning is the verbal support and a lot of talking. And, you know, cause you wanna be able to say, think about this, but mm -hmm. if you, you know, when games get really talky, you zone out, right? And also, if games are really talky, then you might be losing part of the, the audience. And so that's just something that I think about a lot more now. <laughs> and I think that just um, also underscores the importance of testing, 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 mm -hmm. of going in as many times as possible to watch kids play with it and, and noting, is there a difference between how the boys are playing and the girls are playing? Is there a difference um, for kids who are stronger readers versus not as strong? Are where, where are things failing and where are things really working and which kids are connecting to which pieces? Mm -hmm. I think there's a scale for accessibility too, right? So um, as you test, you find things out. And so like if you realize, oh, it shouldn't code everything on red and green because now red and green colorblind players can't play this game at all. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's a very simple change that you can make. And maybe people with um, more intense disabilities, you know, 
maybe you can't reach everybody, but for the people that you do uh, reach out to, you make sure that they can play your game. They are so thankful that um, the game works for them because so few games do. And so, um, you know, sometimes you don't have the resources to make um, the game work for every single accessibility, but every one that you can get um, just brings more people who, um, it's more enjoyment that they can have into their lives. And so um, each little piece can be really worth it. How easy, because you were talking about doing product testing, essentially, to figure out some of those answers. How um, easy is it for you to find out the, some of the information that would make, so what, I, I, is, there re is there research that you, um, we'll come to talk to you in a minute about like what research we should do next, but how easy is it for you to find out like what research already exists, or um, what kinds of specs? Like, you know, so for instance, red and green is one of the easier ones, but are there places um, that you're able to go to to find out if, if, you know, if we kind of designed the game with these kinds of things in mind, then we would be able to reach more learners. Or is it more of it just trying to like product test and figure it out as you go? We launched um, an app last week, actually, called Measure Up, um, which was the culmination. Oh, the lights just dimmed. <laughs> Measure <laughs> Up. It's very <laughs> important <laughs> that you remember that. Um, uh, that uh, was uh, the culmination of about four years of research um, where we had done paper testing with kids, pre and post testing as they were playing with certain games, and then um, built a learning analytics framework to you know, kind of do a neural net to begin trying to figure out which kinds of games kids would score in which ways as they played, um, so that you can kind of watch this over time and begin to predict which things are going to help move the needle and which things aren't. Um, and it's, it's been a really fascinating pro project, at the very least, to, to kind of break down the different types of, of gameplay. Um, if you have questions about this, Bill Shripman right here from WGBH um, did a lot of the early testing work with us around Curious George games and the realization that different types of games actually hit different parts of the learning cycle, places where you are just being introduced to a topic versus places where you actually want to start practicing versus how can you actually use the game to assess how well a child has understood these, these concepts. Um, and so I think there's, there's a growing body of research that's helping us understand more and more about how a child can learn through a game experience and what then we can iterate upon um, based on what we're seeing. Uh, there's also the idea of games literacy, right? How many games has the kid played before your game? Because your game may be the first game that the kid has ever played. Um, and so in that case, you have to also work the game mechanics so that they're available to, you know, kids of very different levels can respond and enjoy them. Um, so you have to be really careful of action mechanics, right? It, particularly if you're in a school context where everyone in the classroom is expected to play the game, you need to be really careful with anything Twitch. You need to be careful with anything experience bars. All the things that, as a gamer, you know and love and are so comfortable with because you've been staring at it for you know years. Um, you, a kid may not know any of that at all, right? And so being able to boil it down um, and get away from some of those traditional systems so that you're not relying on them so that, you know, if, um, if a gamer in the classroom loves the game, that also a non-gamer can still um, enjoy the experience. Um, uh, on the uh, diversity and inclusion part, um, one of the things I wanted to say is that uh, don't be afraid to ask other people. Um, I, you know, at Tokoboka, we have maybe 70 people uh, across three offices um, in two countries, and we have, we bring our own, you know, experiences, but, and our own knowledge and expertise, but there's some things that we still don't know, and so we uh, make a point of reaching out to um, people who know more than we do. Um, if we don't know where the research is, we find somebody who does, and um, ask for help. I mean, I think just not assuming that you can figure it out necessarily when there's someone out there who actually has probably already figured it out. Um, don't be afraid to ask them. And to that point, I think that if, if you're lucky enough to be able to have a budget to do a lot of formative testing, that is fantastic. But you can also can do um, or partner with a grad student or a, you know someone in a, in a college program about um, the sort of game that you're interested in making to help you do a literature scan and see what is out there because there is a mountain of research and it is really hard to climb that and keep on top of it. I am constantly seeing stuff posted and I do not 
I cannot keep up with it because there is so much stuff going on. So for a new project, we're working with someone who's going to, you know, one step is doing a literature scan of what's out there with the specific thing that we're doing and, you know, what is the research that can help us so that we can more finely tune our play testing questions and our formative research testing. Are there any um, researchers in the audience? Oh, thank you. Um, so what, is, what are some of the qu in questions that you would actually love to know the answer to that you don't or that you're not sure of? I have a couple, but <laughs> other ones that... Well, so one of the things I, I'm really curious about is that people who design games are really good at knowing um, the, the pacing for a game to, get to keep students um, going or adults going. But I don't, I haven't run across the information that really helps us understand what that means developmentally. Like, so we know how to make the game that keeps students engaged or young people engaged, but what does that mean in terms of their attention span? What does that mean in terms of their processing speeds? Like, what's the long-term impact for that? So it's a question I would love to have more research on. But I imagine as you guys have been developing games or thinking about this, you probably have some other questions you'd love to, to really know more, uh, more nuanced understandings of. I think for me, it's always very specific to the project because mm -hmm the way that a question can be asked, there's so many ways, and the, the, slightly, the slight variations in how you ask that question mm -hmm. is gonna give you a very different answer. So broadly, um, I, I actually can't think about it in broad terms, just mm -hmm. in really specific things as we're you know, looking at new projects and you know, we're looking at doing something with um, parents of at-risk children. So it's like, I wanna know very, sp we wanna know very specific things about that community, mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, yeah, so that's how I think about it. I would love more uh, longitudinal research. We know that after kids play for something for a little while, maybe they kind of get those skills now, but do they remember them three months down the road, a year down the road? Like how, there aren't many long-term studies out there right now. Uh, and then, um, well, I'll just, I'll give you time. Um, I would love to think about the workflow between game development and research. I think for educational games, not just kids games, but educational games in general, it's so important, right? It's so important to say, if we're making these games that are going to have particular outcomes, to be able to have some evidence of those outcomes at the end of the day. Um, but I've worked at four different startups, right? And so the process is you have the startup, you make the thing, you test it, and then by that time, hopefully you still have some money, right? And you can convince people to start buying the game, and then if your game is good enough, some independent researchers may come along and say, hey, I'd love to do a study on this. You know, it's gonna maybe take me a year, take me two. And the difference between, the tempo between developing a game at a startup and researching it is so different mm -hmm. that it, it's really important for startups, but it's hard to get that right. It's hard to get that tempo right. Um, and so figuring out a better way of working that in and matching the tempo so that the game developers can slow down just a little bit and the research can speed up just a little bit so we can match um, would be really strong for the whole industry. I so think so many of us also are developing games for informal environments, mm -hmm. uh, but once you do research, that's often done as kind of a more formal intervention, and that isn't necessarily replicating the way that kids are going to play with it in the wild, and that's, that's a real issue as well, because we're designing yep. for different environments than we actually are testing on. So how, what, what does it all mean? So we're doing, um, so, so the department, one, we are actually trying to create more partnerships with researchers mm -hmm. um, at all stages and not just the kind of, okay, come in at the end and tell us the evaluation or some, some question. Um, and even before, like, what we'd love to start seeing is even before you start building the app that you're actually looking at learning science and what the to know like what is good for kids and then designing around that. We're starting to see a little bit more of that. Um, it's probably we are also in a right now um, piloting a rapid cycle um, evaluation. It's a toolkit in the wizard for, uh, for doing evaluation, we basically for allowing um, these kind of shorter term, be able to get much faster feedback, um, specifically for, for ed tech. Um, so that will be, we're piling some things this fall and that, that will launch um, in January. But it would also be able to be used for games and at different stages in that development. But it is, I mean, I'd love actually to see more of that interaction between researchers um, and not, again, not just kind of coming in at the end part of that. Um, I think we only have a couple minutes, but I wanted to have kind of the last one, which is like, where do you think the next, um, kind of like big thing or direction or advancement that's gonna, that, that's gonna come for, um, for games, for early learners? Or something that you're really excited about? So um, for me, I think the, the next advancement is actually just better execution of things that we've been excited about for a while, mm -hmm. right? So you've got things like formative assessments being built into the game. Um, people have latched around this idea. I think it's a, 
it's an idea that almost everyone can, can enjoy. Like, you never have to take a test again. Just play this game as you're playing. We'll figure out where you're at and then be able to assess it. Um, but there's very few games that do it very well because it's very complicated, right? You have to have assessment just right. You have to have some of the research behind it. Hopefully, you're showing transference to other skills. And so it's this awesome idea, but I don't think we've actually like capitalized on it in most instances. And so the I think the promise of educational games is that we now have the design, the general gameplay down and uh, engaging enough that we can start to tackle some of these other issues that we've thought about for a long time, but we can start finally bringing those benefits in um, to the design experience and to the gameplay experience. I guess, go, you know, going, going big, it's the, it's the whale jumping out of the thing for Magic Leap. Really like that's cool, right? <laughs> like the really, the really immersive <coughs> learning mm -hmm. um, as the devices, you know, get smaller, get more subtle, get more connected to movement and gesture and action and... Mm -hmm you know, just are more like real life, that you can make those really immersive experiences that make algebra actually come alive in a really fun way, an interesting way, that it's not happening on the, you know, on the textbook um, level, or like really make things come alive. Um, give kids that first experience so that they can, you know, test out things, you know, you do a lot of firsts when you're three years old, four years old, five years old, and to, you know, immersive game experience can can help soften some of those things that might seem a little bit scary the first time. Um, I think kids today have you know access to a lot of really cool creation tools. I think um, seeing more uh, multimedia creativity tools for kids. Um, you know, kids are consuming media in so many different ways. Our kids spend so many hours, especially maybe not preschoolers, but like YouTube is you know huge. Um, giving kids more tools to create themselves, I think that's I think we'll see more of that. I think adaptability, um, the idea that the game can actually start to um, change based on the needs of the of the learner, um, whether that means helping them with the skills they're clearly struggling with, or whether it means kind of shifting the audio so that they can hear it better, you know, depending on their own developmental needs. Uh, I think there's a real um, real promise there and how the technology is changing to be able to adapt to learners. I think we have time for maybe one question, maybe two. Sure. Back the... <laughs> Sure. Um, so I'd say for parents, no. Um, there is a, a lot of surveys that people have done, um, and parents are very aware of their kids growing up in a technological age. And so sometimes you have to convince the parent that you are teaching them something. So we can watch a parent who doesn't know how to code, um, you know, watch their kid drag our block-based tiles um, and program, and the parent's like, well, that's great, but they're playing a game. Like, wh where's the code? And so um, convincing them that they should learn code is not the problem, but convincing them like what code is. And parents really want a nice dashboard, right? Some parents like to check on their kids' progress, and other parents like to um, check on their kids' progress when there's like a problem, right? Um, and so for particularly for the parents who are going to use it very gently, right? Only when they're like, mm, is my kid still using this? Like, do, do they care about, like, what have they learned? Being able to give to the parent very succinctly, like, yes, your child has learned sequencing, here's what sequencing is, and also it's fine that you don't know what sequencing is, don't feel bad about yourself. So it's kind of, you know, you have to educate the kid, you have to educate the parent. For teachers, this is also true, right? Many teachers are very intimidated by coding, something that they've never had to do, and now it's something that they're supposed to pass on. And so you're educating everybody at the same time, and then also educating them of what the other people are doing. Um, and that's, I think that's the bigger challenge than convincing someone that coding is important, which is actually, um, pre seems pretty heavily on the rise right now. <laughs> <laughs>